Darkcast Network. Out of the shadows come the best indie podcasts. Do you have a story of survival? A parent goes to residential school. You know, they haven't had that family connection. Those traditional values and ceremonies that, that many of us exposed to are taken. Or have a lost loved one that was involved in human trafficking, exploitation, missing or murdered? My name is Jasmine Castillo, and I am the host of Hands Off My Podcast that brings to the forefront, specifically from Asian American, Native Hawaiian, Pacific Islander, Black Indigenous people of color. Anderson County, okay. 911, what's the location of your emergency? Ma'am, what's going on out there? You're saying that baby's missing in the night. As well as nonprofit organizations. When I was a prime investigator five years ago, um, we picked up a case that was Shanice Harris' case. That help and advocate families of lost loved ones with their closure. From some time from his shift at work to that next day, he was either robbed or apprehended at some point with someone coming into the restaurant. And opening a cold case. So that, to me, was his, his way out. And it negatively impacted Armani's investigation. Please join me on Thursdays on any podcast platform wherever you listen to your podcasts. We are voiceless no more. Hey, I use foul language. No, no, not like chicken foul. I mean, I do use swear words at times. And if that offends you, I'm not your girl. Hey there, Rainbow Warriors, and welcome to Beyond the Rainbow, True Crimes of the LGBTQ+. I'm your host, CJ. Let's start off with a tiny bit of good news and some unicorn justice for the family of Ray Hainish. Ray's case I covered several years ago after he'd been murdered by a guy named Garrett Kurtz. In case you need a refresher, it was Season 3, Episode 10, To Ray with Love. Garrett had killed a girl that he'd been dating named Nicole Bowen, and a couple weeks before he killed Nicole, he strangled Ray to death in Ray's own home. And then Kurtz had his friends over to Ray's for a party while Ray lay dead in his bedroom. Kurtz is a sick fuck who was sentenced to 55 years for Nicole Bowen's murder, but several years ago the district attorney where Ray lived in White County, Indiana, was named Robert Guy. Robert Guy was a lazy, self-serving piece of crap who wouldn't do anything to get justice for Ray, most likely because Ray was a gay man. And Robert Guy felt he already had Kurt's conviction for Nicole, so why even bother going after him for Ray? The new district attorney in White County went after Garrett Kurtz for Ray's murder, and Kurtz was convicted for another 55 years. So that scum of the earth, Garrett Kurtz, he will never be a free man again, thankfully. Our missing but not forgotten LGBTQ person this episode is a case that was actually sent to me from another podcast. That podcast is called Cold and Missing with Allie and Eli. They did a full episode on this missing person for their show. I listened to a couple of their episodes, and I really liked it. I think you will too, so be sure to check it out. That's Cold and Missing Podcast. 55-year-old lesbian folk singer Melissa Crabtree from Taos, New Mexico, went missing February 11, 2020. This was at the beginning of that damn COVID-19 invasion. At that time, Melissa was 51 years old. Melissa was born a Sagittarius on December 1, 1968. She's a very experienced outdoors and nature explorer. She's led whitewater rafting tours and sea kayaking excursions, as well as wilderness hikes. Melissa is also a very talented musical artist in the folk music genre. I was fortunate enough to find some of her songs on YouTube, and I enjoyed them very much. I'll leave a link to a couple of them in the show notes. When I listened, it kind of took me back to when I first came out, and I was chilling to lesbian singers like Chris Williamson and the Indigo Girls. Melissa's music brought a really good memory to me. 
Unfortunately, in the past couple of years before Melissa's disappearance, she had been battling bouts of depression and Lyme disease. Lyme disease in itself is enough to make anyone depressed. It's usually caused by being bitten by a tick that carries the Borrelia bacteria. And the side effects from it are horrible. It can cause problems with your heart, your immune system, your nervous system. It can leave your joints and muscles stiff, and it will often make you extremely tired. Seeing how Melissa is an outdoor nature-loving lady, it's easy to see how she may have been bitten by a bacteria-carrying tick, and how she could become very depressed from not being able to do physically the same things that she used to do outside. According to the podcast Cold and Missing, Melissa was going through a very rough patch on February 6, 2020. She had just lost her father. She was facing homelessness. She was going through a breakup, and her Lyme disease was really messing with her, not just physically, but mentally as well. At this time, Melissa drove her car to the Rio Gorge Bridge. She parked near it, and she had intentions of jumping off the bridge. But instead, she called her ex-girlfriend. Her ex picked her up and took her to a psychiatric hospital. Melissa voluntarily checked herself in and stayed for five days here. Now, Melissa's disappearance is really an odd one. She's listed as disappearing from Taos February 11th, and her car that was identified to be registered to Melissa Crabtree was still near the Rio Gorge Bridge two days later on February 13th. But her car had been there since she left it on February 6th. It had even been tagged to be towed. Inside the car was Melissa's cell phone, which I guess wasn't too weird for her because most of us were really attached to our phones. When Melissa wanted to be out in nature, she usually left her phone behind. On March 2nd through March 5th, fearing Melissa might have jumped from the bridge, the river under the bridge was dragged and searched, but there was no sign of Melissa. Even a helicopter was deployed to scout the canyon around the bridge, and still no Melissa. Whitewater rafters traveled the river in vain, also searching for her, but they too came up empty. Police still believed that Melissa had jumped, and would be found later when the water level lowered in the summer heat. Well, that theory never panned out. A friend of Melissa's thoroughly believes they saw her at a Hindu temple in Taos on February 23rd. They didn't just see her, though. This friend says that she spent at least an hour, if not longer, speaking to Melissa. On February 29th, Melissa's brother, who did not live near her, reported her missing to the police in Taos, because he had not heard from her in two weeks. Her brother made plans with his wife to go to Taos, but with the COVID lockdowns, it was not an easy task. Melissa's brother and sister-in-law arrived in Taos, and they spoke with many people there. It would seem other folks of Taos had claimed to see and speak with Melissa after she went missing. There's a strong possibility Melissa might still be alive. She might be homeless, and she's possibly in very poor health. A year after Melissa disappeared, a friend of Melissa's is 99% sure she saw Melissa in Pueblo, Colorado. She didn't approach the woman that she believed to be Melissa. She was in fear of spooking her and putting her in more danger. Melissa Crabtree is 5'7", approximately 150 pounds. She has brownish blonde hair and blue eyes. I'll post a picture of her on my website for reference. It's imperative Melissa is found so that her loved ones can give her the care and the help that she needs. Should you have any information of any kind on the whereabouts of Melissa Crabtree, please call Taos Central Dispatch at area code 575-758-2216. Oh my God, Warriors. This episode's main case reads like a gay celebrity tabloid. It's yet another breaking case this time out of Australia. The participants involved are very good-looking men. Yes, I hate to admit it, but even the killer is decent-looking, at least on the outside. The victims, however, well, 
They could have been movie stars. 28-year-old Beau Lamar Condon, that's Condon, not Condom, was starstruck in his teen years and his early 20s. He became what can be called a celebrity chaser. This is essentially someone who finds out where celebrities will be and they make sure that they're there too. For Bo, this included going to award shows and movie premieres. It seemed that Bo had a celebrity blog online. He also ran a website for amateur actors. I watched a clip of Bo interviewing actor Ben Stiller at the premiere of The Secret Life of Walter Mitty movie. In the past, Bo has taken pictures with Harry Styles, John Travolta, Taylor Swift, Ryan Gosling, Miley Cyrus, and more. At a Lady Gaga concert, he threw a note up on stage to her coming out as gay. The note read, Through your music, you've helped, and you will continue to set free many people. If possible, I would love to come and personally give you a hug and a thank you backstage. For finally setting me free. My life will then be forever complete. When she read that note, she invited him to her dressing room after the show. Bo liked pretty things, and to say he had a fetish for being near pretty things is probably an understatement. It doesn't seem like he ever really got to the point of being a stalker, at least not with the aforementioned celebrities. But Bo eventually did give up his life of celebrity chasing. He gave it up to become a police officer for New South Wales. On February 16, 2024, Bo went to the storage at the Miranda Police Station in South Sydney, and he checked out a service gun. And this part is important because getting guns in Australia is really pretty difficult, I understand. Bo's reason for checking out the gun was to work a protest on Sunday. It's not known if Bo ever showed up that Sunday to patrol the protest. 26-year-old Jesse Baird was a news reporter. Jesse had a home in Paddington, which is an upscale neighborhood in East Sydney. Jesse had also started a brand new relationship with 29-year-old Luke Davies. Luke was a flight attendant for Qantas Airlines. Jesse had left his position reporting the news to host a children's show and then a live-action video game series in Australia. That series was called Gamify. But eventually he left that game show and he went back to news reporting until early this year. And that's when he decided to quit and find job fulfillment elsewhere. As I was saying, Jesse and Luke were somewhat new in their relationship, but they seemed to be a great match. Luke had just relocated to Sydney from Brisbane, and that's where he met Jesse. The two enjoyed going hiking together, visiting wineries, watching Survivor, and they had just recently went to a Pink concert together. Before Luke, Jesse had a brief friends with benefits relationship with Bo. But Jesse just wasn't into Bo like Bo was into him. Bo became very clingy with the news reporter and he told Jesse he had deep feelings for him. Jesse told Bo their relationship wasn't going to be any more than what it was already. Then Bo would post on social media that he and Jesse were a couple. Jesse found out about this, and he definitely ended the friendship with Bo for good, or at least he thought he did. In August of 2023, before Jesse was with Luke, Jesse had called a friend up, and he told the friend he was scared. He said he was followed home by a cop car, and then during the night he felt like someone was watching him as he slept. The presence in his room woke him, and when he woke up, he saw the figure steal his cell phone and wallet. Jesse took Chase in his neighborhood after the perpetrator, but he just couldn't catch him. Ooh, that's such a creepy feeling to have eyes on you when you're alone and sleeping in your bed. On Monday, February 19, 2024, around 9.50 a.m., Jesse's neighbors heard shots coming from Jesse's home. The shots weren't reported until days later, though. Four minutes after the gunshots, a call to 000, which is Australia's emergency number, came from either Luke or Jesse's phone, but the call was disconnected before a dispatcher could answer. 
That same evening, friends and family members tried to contact the men and they became worried when they were unable to. Around 11 a.m. on Wednesday, the 21st of February, bloodied clothing and personal items belonging to Jesse and Luke were found in an open dumpster in Cronola. Cronola is about 30 minutes from Jesse's house. A search for the missing men ensued, and then an examination of Jesse's house in Paddington, which turned up a large amount of blood in the home, but no Jesse and no Luke. Investigators also searched Luke's home in Waterloo, which is a suburb of South Sydney, but they found nothing relevant to the disappearance of the couple. On Friday, February 23rd, in the morning, Officer Beau Lamar Condon turned himself in to the police in Bondi for the murder of Jesse and Luke. He was arrested and charged for two counts of first-degree murder. But with zero help from Bo, police began searching waterways and rural properties in Sydney looking for Jesse and Luke. It really was the proverbial needle in the haystack, and law enforcement came up empty-handed. Finally, Tuesday, the 27th of February, Bo gives detectives the location of where he put the bodies of Jesse and Luke. He also gave them a timeline of the brutal slayings of both men. After shooting and killing Jesse and Luke in Jesse's home on Monday, February 19th, Bo went to the Sydney airport and he rented a white van. The following day, he admits to an acquaintance that he may have been involved in the killing of two people. With Bo being law enforcement, the acquaintance may have thought nothing of it. Also on Tuesday the 20th, Bo drove the rented van to Cronola to dispose of Jesse and Luke's bloody clothing and some personal belongings of the couple into that dumpster where it was found on Wednesday. Later on Wednesday, Bo enlists the help of his good female friend. Now mind you, the friend had no idea what she was being an accomplice to but she helped Bo move Jesse and Luke's bodies that were stuffed into surf bags. I assume a surf bag is like a big duffel bag for surfboards, but when his friend moved the bags to a property near Bungonia, but first they stopped for Bo to buy a lock and an angle grinder. An angle grinder is an abrasive cutter and polishing tool. They got to the property. Bo, using the grinder, cuts an old lock off of the gate to the property. And then the two sit there and they wait for about a half an hour. I'm not sure why. Maybe he's just waiting to see if there's any people around. Bo removes whatever he's lugging around in the van, which we know are the bodies of Jesse and Luke. And then Bo and his friend drive through the gate again. Bo puts a new lock on the gate and they return to Sydney late afternoon. Before saying goodbye to his friend, Bo borrows some lanterns or torches from his friend and then Bo returns to the property after 11 p.m. that night. He's afraid that his friend might blab about dropping something on that property in Bungonia. By 4.30 a.m. on Thursday, Bo had moved the bodies and he was headed back to Sydney, but not without first stopping at another friend's home. At this friend's house, he asked to borrow their hose so he could clean the van out before he returned it. But by Thursday evening, Bo's face was all over the media with this caption. Police officer is suspected in the disappearance of Jesse Baird and Luke Davies. The following morning on Friday is when Bo turned himself in. And on Monday is when Jesse and Luke's bodies were found on another property in Bungonia. It was very close to the original property he dumped them on. But this time at the second property, Jesse and Luke's bodies were closer to the fence line, near the entrance of the property, and the surf bags had been covered with rocks and nature debris. The service gun Bo used to shoot the couple had been returned to the Miranda police station by Bo before he gave himself up. At this time, Bo remains in custody, and he's not scheduled to have his trial begin until April 2024. I'll keep watching for updates on this case, and in particular what sentence Bo will receive, since I'm pretty sure a jury will find him culpable of this horrific murder of Jesse and Luke. I learned you can't force someone to love you, 
and the more you try, the more uncomfortable the other person will become and push away. And not only that, you're wasting your time hoping that person will come around and love you back. Precious time that could be spent finding someone else who will reciprocate your love. I wish I could tell you I learned that from hours of professional therapy. But in truth, it came from hours of self-therapy and journaling after a particularly bad breakup years ago. Rest in power, Jesse and Luke. Our true crime quickie this episode is from Dover, England in 2007. 22-year-old Philippa Hart and her 27-year-old boyfriend, Christopher Graham, met a very flamboyant 22-year-old gay man by the name of David Redman. They met David at a pub in Dover. After the trio were done getting their drink on at the pub, the young couple invited David back to their place for another drink. David agreed, and he headed back to the couple's home with them. Those who lived in the area of Dover who knew David, they called him Camp David. Although it's never been explained why he was called that, I believe David might have lived in a homeless encampment in the area, unless they called him that for his flamboyant campy style. Either way, David still went home with the couple. After a bit in the young couple's home, Christopher began to accuse David of stealing items from them, and with unreal quickness, he pounced on David, hitting him, kicking him, and once David was on the floor, Christopher stomped on David's throat. With David barely clinging to life, Christopher and Philippa carried David to the edge of the sea behind their home, and then they rolled David into the sea. David's body has never been found. When friends or possibly some family members of David couldn't get in contact with him, they reported him missing. Video surveillance from the pub was looked at, and he was seen at the pub with Christopher and Philippa. The police went right to the home of the couple, and they brought him in for questioning. Christopher denied any involvement in David's disappearance. But after a bit of talking, Philippa divulged everything and she said that she only helped Christopher roll David's body into the ocean because she was scared of him, and she didn't want him hurting her. The couple went to trial, where a forensic specialist told the court that they found blood droplets on Philippa's clothing and blood along with human tissue consistent to an attack on David on Christopher's clothing. Both Philippa and Christopher were sentenced to life. For Philippa, that would be a minimum of 15 years, and for Christopher, a minimum of 20. Philippa should have been up for parole last year, but no word if it was granted to her. Rest in power, David. Well, that's it for this episode. I love you, Rainbow Warriors. You matter. Drink your water and hydrate yourselves. And remember, it's not a crime to be gay, unless you're a murderer. <laughs>